Okay, so um, today I'm going to be talking about the sort of the more advanced, my, or a couple of the more advanced MIMO concepts that I mentioned in my talk last year. Um, just to show hands, who, who was here last year and saw my, my talk? Okay, good. Good, okay, so I'll, I'll just step through a couple of, a, a, a little bit of the previous stuff um, quickly just to give some background. Um, uh, basically, I talked about MIMO and, and uh, how multipath uh, causes um, uh, issues that, that, that MIMO can help solve and, um, and uh, how, we, how we can look at that, how we can model it, how we can model it in GNU radio and that sort of thing. So we talked about multipath and constant versus time varying and um, uh, Doppler and all that sort of stuff. And uh, uh, if you if you're, find yourself bored on, uh, on a Saturday night, uh, you can always go back and, and watch the video, which I think has been put back up after our takedown notice, um, which I was, I, was, I was very proud of that last year. Um, but in any case, um, uh, the, the, the basic, this is the basic model of a communication system. Um, and uh, can everybody see my pointer? Yeah. Okay. So there's all the, all these things in a normal uh, modern communication system, but um, most of this is going to be uh, left out of, of what I'm talking about today, and I'm just talking about really the the MIMO sections of it, and the and the rest of it is um, is uh, you know assumed everything is synchronized and assumed uh, that uh, channelization happens, and um, all of the all of the fading that I talk about today is going to be flat fading. Um, which uh, in, a, in a single carrier system is maybe not that um, likely in the real world, but the reality is uh, in a modern communication system, you'll typically use OFDM and thus will give you a, a set of, of uh, flat fading channels. So, so everything we're, we're gonna be doing here today is flat fading, but it applies to non-flat fading as long as you use OFDM or something like that. Um, and uh, um, uh, yeah, but we, it will be dynamic fading, right? It will be time varying fading. It will just be flat across frequency. So we, we talked about MIMO uh, last time, um, how it increases reliability and throughput, um, but there's some overhead in terms of um, hardware complexity and stuff like that. And, um, and I, I went through these MIMO techniques last time, but we stopped after space-time coding and didn't do these this sort of true MIMO stuff here, um, which is, uh, in this case, spatial multiplexing and pre-coding, and that, that's what I'm gonna cover today. Um, and uh, Massive MIMO will still be a, a future exercise, so uh, won't be covered today. So we did, we did receive diversity, which is, I guess, uh, 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 MISO, right? Uh, but I use the blanket term, term MIMO, even if there's only one transmitter or one receiver, as long as there's multiple on at least one side. Um, and of course, somebody's calling me in the middle of this. Um, and uh, so, good, so we had transmit diversity we talked about and space-time coding, and that's where we left off, and then we got to the, the advanced MIMO. So, so that's what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, and there's two, two basic categories that, that I'm gonna talk about. The first is, I'm actually gonna re reverse the slide, but first talk about spatial multiplexing, and then uh, about pre-coding. So, um, but before we do it, let's just review um, MIMO uh, propagation. Um, and, and really, it, it's all matrix math. Um, for, for some, that's, oh, good. And for some people, that's, uh, oh, no, <laughs> it's matrix math. But, um, but really, it, it, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you, you have some collection of transmit antennas and some collection of receive antennas, and all of the, tra all the transmit antennas have paths to all of the receive antennas, and you and H is typically used for a transfer function. So we use H11 to mean go from first transmitter to first receiver, H21 first transmitter to second receiver, and 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 the like. Um, those H's you can collect into a matrix, and you can multiply use matrix multiplication rather than individually doing all of the elements. Um, very often, um, when we see H in, as a transfer function, like for a filter it has many, many taps for the same channel, and that's because it is a frequency selective channel, right, because it has uh, width in time. Um, but as I said earlier, everything we're doing is frequency flat today, so, so these are all single taps. So H, 
H21 is one value. If H21 had, had many values in time and it be, be, thus became a filter, we would fix that with OFDM so that we were, had single taps. So all of these you can look at as a single complex number. All these numbers should be assumed to be complex unless we say otherwise. So, so you have this N by M or uh, NT, NR by NT uh, matrix that, uh, that is called H. Um, and X is the transmit signal, and Y is the receive signal, and N is, is noise. And so I give the, the size of the matrices here, um, just uh, so you can follow, right? So, so why is NR, uh, why is uh, N and Y uh, uh, NR by one? It's because there's an NR receivers and the noise, it, it happens at the receiver. Um, the, and uh, why is H, NR by NT, well, when you multiply a, a, an NT by one vector, the number of transmit elements by that, that, that matrix, you get number of received signals, right? So this is, this is the, just the propagation expressed as matrix math. So, um, so, so let's say we, we have the system where we want to do, you know, do something um, more interesting than just send one, sig one signal on one antenna to one, uh, uh, to one receiving antenna. Um, well, how, how, do we, how do we do that? Well, um, we, we, we modulate the X and we look at the Y and then we have to look at the Y and figure out what X was sent. And that's the ultimate goal of communications is to sort of reverse the channel. So, so we, could, we could invert the channel. Um, you, you know, if we have H, right, we've sensed H using some sort of um, uh, 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 pilot tones or something. So, we, so the receiver does have a picture an estimate of what the channel looks like. Um, so you could invert it, right? Well, um, uh, and, and that, that would result in, you know, your X tilde, your, your estimate of, of, um, of the, the signal as being e equal to, uh, sorry, I, I wrote that wrong there. It's a, a X plus H, that's what I get from putting too much math in these. It's X plus um, uh, H inverse of N. So, so that seems pretty straightforward. So why don't we just invert the, invert the matrix of the channel? Well, so there's a number of reasons. One is, first, sometimes it's not square. Um, you may have more transmit antennas than receive antennas. But um, even more important is it could be ill-conditioned. Um, and what that means is there may not be an inverse, or the inverse may be numerically unstable. And, and so what you would see here from this uh, minor uh, last equation with a small error in it, you would get the received value plus inverse of the noise, but if, if the, uh, if the channel was very weak and you invert it, you, your noise explodes. And so, um, and we see that in normal frequency domain equalizers or, or, or in, in normal equalizers of um, frequency selective channels, you get noise amplification where the channel was weak. Well, this is the same thing just applied to multiple antennas instead of multiple time samples. So, so in, just simply inverting the channel is not, is not, um, is not trivial. Um, but um, there, are, uh, there are ways that we can, um, can, can effectively accomplish the same thing. And, um, and so then the question becomes, well, do we, do we sort of do this inversion just at the receiver or do we do it at the transmitter or do we kind of split it? And so, so the, first, the first option um, would be uh, what, what we call spatial multiplexing. And in, in spatial multiplexing, what you do is you, 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 don't, you, you allow the receiver to do all the, the inversion of the channel or the, the detection of the channel. And you just let the transmitter, you say, okay, I've got three antennas, I'm gonna send three different signals on, uh, you know, a different signal on each antenna, and we'll leave it to the receiver to figure that out. And, and so, so I'll show you what, what that actually sort of looks like um, here. Uh, if, unfortunately, that's not popping up properly. Oh, there we go, okay. Um, there we go. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly show the spatial multiplexing demo. And I'll, go, I'll go back and I'll show what's in it in a moment. So, so uh, what, what we have here is I have two antennas. We're simulating two antennas. Actually, maybe I should show, the, show the, the flow graph first. So we have two signal sources. One is generating uh, QAM16. The other is, is generating QPSK. I just used two different ones so it's easy to tell them apart in, in the diagram. Um, we throttle one of them, um, and we send it through this apply MIMO taps block. So what that is, that's just the channel. So uh, uh, that that would be um, uh, ooh, here, here it is. So we what it does is it takes in your your input signal, 
the, your, which is two signals, right? One for each antenna. We're doing all two by two in the in the demonstrations today, and that goes. Each input signal goes to two multipliers, and then you have these um, your channel taps H00, H10, H01, H11. And what that what that means is that each input signal is then is multiplied by these complex factors and then added into um, each of the output signals. So both outputs are, are linear combinations of the inputs, which is what you would expect from matrix math. So this is, this is just a very um, quick uh, 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 module to, to do that addition. And then I have a separate module in the main flow graph that, that actually generates those taps. So we have four independent fading channels here. And then to simulate correlation between them, um, because correlation is the enemy of, of, of MIMO, um, we, we use the, these matrix multiplies just to, um, to, to, to correlate them together. And then we output those in this pad sync. And so, so that's, that's what we get here, right? We have our four channels, our four channel taps, and they go to, into this uh, MIMO channel. And then we have the two input signals in the MIMO channel here. And then we, of course, add noise at the receivers, and that comes out into the constellation sync. So, so let's run that. And so here, I have manual control of the taps. This is not automatic. So on the left, we have the two constellations. One is the QAM 16 in blue. One is the, um, is the, the PSK in red. And all the channel taps are set to zero. So you see just random noise on both receivers. Well, the first receiver is blue and the second receiver is red. So if we, if we start playing with the channel taps, right? So we, this says, H00 says the first, the, the first, in, um, First transmitter is connected to the first receiver by this gain. So I, I made it non-zero, and you can see it comes through. And then if we set H11, you could see that the second transmitter goes into the second receiver. Now, this would be like fiber optics, right? They're not, they're not crossing each other at all here. So in practice, you would also have this cross, um, this cross uh, signals, right? The H10, the H01. And that, that makes some cool pictures in the, in, the, in the display, but that's actually pretty hard for the receiver to, uh, to um, decode. But, but what you're seeing is, so if you look at the blue on the right, for example, you've got the dominant signal is the QAM 16 is coming in and causing 16 different constellation points, but added on top of it, you have the other signal, the cross signal, coming in and it's adding this circle on top of it. Now, if I just did QAM 16 for both of these, it would just look like you know, a grid. So, um, and, and you're unlikely to see this, this sort of pretty a picture in a real receiver, but this is, this is what's happening, right? And you know, I've got noise, but if we, if we take the noise down, you can see what it, what it looks like, right? Now, I, I just have real channel taps here because I can, um, so I can use sliders, and actually, uh, if, if Hakan is here, but my, my request is, a, is the equivalent of a, of a QT slider GUI, but two dimensions, so you can do complex numbers with it. That's, that's, my, that's my feature request of the, of the, of the year. Um, but in any case, so, so this is what happens. Now, how does the receiver decode this? Well, the receiver can, could multiply this by the inverse of the channel, um, but that, that could be, um, uh, that, that's messy. So there's, a, there's other algorithms, but here I'm going to, now I'm going to show, um, that, that was sort of manually setting all of the taps. I'm going to now put the, the, um, this is, this is the automatic, uh, setting of the tap. So we'll turn on some Doppler. So the channel is varying and this is no correlation, right? Um, actually here, let's slow down the Doppler. So, so this, this is a, this is a hypothetical channel. Um, with no correlation, but as it correlates, you can see that the two constellations that are received approach each other. And when you have perfect correlation, now you no longer have two independent estimates of what's going on. And, and so this, in this situation, the second receiver is useless and, and you would only have the information from, from one receiver to, to do this decoding, right? So, so again, that's why correlation is the enemy of, of MIMO. And, and so, uh, and that's why you sort of have to space your antennas apart sufficiently in order to get independent multipath. But now, let's say you have this system and you are attempting to, uh, to decode that. Well, how, does, how would you do that? Well, um, the, the, the most common uh, methods for doing this are, are the, what, what's called the maximum likelihood method, where you have, you're, you're effectively trying all the possible combinations of points and seeing which is the most likely based on, 
on your estimates of the channel and, and the actual received symbols. Um, maximum likelihood grows you know, exponentially in complexity, and so um, there are other methods that have been developed to, um, to do that more efficiently. Um, the, the most commonly used is sphere decoding, um, which is also very, it's very complex computationally, but not nearly as much as maximum likelihood when you have a lot of antennas. Um, but it's also, uh, it, it's quite complex conceptually, but this is sort of a, this is the best picture I was able to find of it, where you, you sort of, the, you have a received signal here, and you say, okay, the, 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 the truth is somewhere in, in, within this sphere, and what is the most likely element within this sphere? It's, it's, um, it's a relatively complex um, algorithm, but it's, it's used in things like uh, Wi-Fi. So Wi-Fi uses multiple layer um, uh, spatial multiplexing uh, in, in the more modern versions. Um, and one of the advantages of, of, of spatial multiplexing is if, if you have decently, uh, decently uncorrelated multipath, your channels will separate and you, you can significantly increase your data rate because you have these parallel channels. And, um, uh, and, and it works with broadcast because you're not, you know, you know, in a broadcast channel, you have different paths to each receiver and you can't, you know, pre-compensate for each of them separately. You, you, so you, you sort of leave it to the receivers. So, so, um, so the advantage of spatial multiplexing is you, there's no need to, um, there's no need to send channel information back to the transmitter. Um, so that reduces overhead uh, and it can be used in a broadcast system. Um, the downside is because you're not doing anything transmit signal, each antenna is radiating omnidirectionally in, in this case, and so you're not getting any antenna gain, right? The, the, the signals are spread and, and you're sending energy everywhere and not necessarily optimizing that transmission. So, so, so that's spatial multiplexing. Um, next we have precoding. And, and you, you can imagine two, two varieties of, uh, of pre -co well, the, the, the most obvious pre-coding was we have, right, if we go back to spatial multiplexing, we have uh, inverting this, this H, you have, you're inverting it at the receiver. Pre-coding would be inverting it at the transmitter, right? And so what does that mean? That means the transmitter needs to know the channel state information. And of course, this again means it's only, uh, you know, only to one user at a time. Um, but um, it, it, it also means that you are sending the energy into the, in the direction of the dominant channel modes. So, so you actually get antenna gain when you do pre-coding because you have now have a correlated signal between your multiple antennas and, and, they, and they are constructively interfering at the receiver. And so you, you actually get antenna gain from pre-coding. Um, the one issue, and, and so the other is, the other issue is we saw here, you get this noise enhancement, right? Because you have H, H to the minus one of N. This is because the receiver has to do this, this multiply by the inverse after reception. So it's already gotten noise. If you do it at the transmitter, the transmitter doesn't have that noise, so it can do that inversion there. And so there's no noise enhancement. Um, but you could have an ill-conditioned uh, channel, which would still result in, in, instead of noise enhancement, it results in very sort of very strong signals. Um, you know, it sort of amplifies what you need to send, and you end up with disparate uh, amplitude between the different channels. Um, and so, so pre precoding is precoding is actually used quite a bit in um, in uh, in cellular systems. Um, it, it's basically uh, it, well, in a in a in a multi-user MIMO system. Um, Pre-coding sort of implies that okay, if this user has a good channel on, um, you know, on on this on these frequency bins of the uh, of the FFT, we'll send to them on those frequency bins, and if this other user has a better channel on these other bins, we'll send to them on those bins, and that's that's effectively pre-coding. You're you're choosing the frequencies to send um, to each user based on 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 which channels are good, and so. Um, so you, 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 th there are many, many, many forms of pre-coding, um, and you, you'll see a variety in, um, in modern uh, uh, cellular systems, certainly. Um, the one I found the most interesting is, is actually where, where we split the channel, and we do part of the inversion at the transmitter, and you do part of the inversion at the receiver. And the tool we use to do that is called uh, the singular value decomposition. And um, the singular value decomposition really comes from uh, a, a, a result in, in linear algebra that says that um, any linear transformation can be represented as a rotation, a scale, and a second rotation. 
And, and rotation could be reflection as well. But um, So essentially, it takes your H, your channel matrix, and it, it separates it into U, sigma, and V. And U and V are, um, are rotations, and they're unitary. And so this is, this is, this is actually key to why, why um, this is so useful. Unitary means that, first it means that the inverse is the same as the conjugate transpose. But the more important thing is, it means that when you, you multiply by a unitary matrix, you don't change the amplitudes. And that's, that's, that's critical. Um, and it's just rotating only. And then you have this sigma, and sigma it, it essentially tells you how strong the different uh, channel modes are. So, so, um, and so we'll get into how that works. But so you take your channel, and, and in, for this to work, both sides need to know what the, the H is. So the, the receiver needs to send channel information back to the transmitter. So we have CSIT, channel state information, at the transmitter. Um, and then both, both apply this, um, this precoding and decoding in order to uh, productively um, transmit. Now, what's, what's key for this is that this works first for non-square matrices, but it also works for ill-conditioned matrices. If, if, if there's, you know, if you don't have two, if you don't have as many uh, paths through the system as you have antennas, it, 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 it's okay. It doesn't, um, it doesn't explode. It doesn't multiply your noise. It doesn't multiply the signal by too much. It, it, it produces useful, uh, safe results for all situations. U, uh, U and V will always be uh, uh, magnitude one, and sigma will just tell you how strong your channel is. So th this is a little hand wavy so far. So let's let's look at what the st the steps are. So first, we we choose our number of spatial streams, and if we re remember, if you have no some number of transmit antennas and some number of receive antennas, you can send as up to the minimum of those two. So if you have, let's say, three transmits and two receives, you can send up to two different spatial streams. Um, but you don't have to choose uh, a two. You could, or in this case, you can use, you can send just one. And the nice thing about this SVD is sigma will tell you if, there, if, if there's any point in using the second spatial uh, mode or not, because, or, or the third or the fourth, because it tells you how strong they all are. So, so the first step is you pre-code at the transmit. So you, you multiply, your, multiply your input symbols by V, which you've gotten from the, the singular value decomposition. And V is a, 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 an NT by NT matrix. Um, so obviously this requires CSI at the transmitter. Um, but it rotates the signal into the dominant eigenmode. Now that's sort of a fancy way of saying it, it, it sends the signal in the direction where there's good paths to the receiver. And so that's, that's where you get gain in, 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 on the transmit side. You're, you're directing the signal towards, um, towards the, the receiver, you know, over the known paths. At the receive side, we multiply by, uh, by the, um, the conjugate of U, which is also a rotation, but this time it's, a, if there's NR receive antennas, then it's an NR by NR matrix. And so now all of the, and well, here, so we'll look at the, the math a little directly. This is the most math I've ever put in slides in my life. Um, but um, so if we go back to the singular value decomposition, we have H, right? That's our channel matrix. And it is, it is decomposed by, and this is a common function in every linear algebra library, into a U, a sigma, and a V, shown either as an inverse or a, or a conjugate uh, transpose. And remember, being unitary, inverse, and conjugate transpose are the same thing. So, um, and then we say, okay, what we really wanted to send is x hat. And so at the transmitter, we pre-code. We take our x hat and we multiply it by v. Not, not the v inverse, but v. And that becomes x, what we actually transmit. So that's our pre-coding operations. Very simple matrix multiply. And you didn't actually even have to do the inverse. The inverse was already done in the SVD, and you could just do a conjugate transpose to get, to get the, the V properly. Um, then we send it over the channel. So we take that X, and it gets multiplied by H, the, um, the channel transfer function. And, and then, unfortunately, noise gets added onto it at the receiver side. And that's why. That's what, that's what the, re the, the receive antenna receives. And if we expand the H in that, we see we have U sigma V, which is the H. Uh, so U sigma V inverse, right? at times x, but x is v x hat, right? And then plus noise. Now, the v inverse times v, of course, cancels, right? And we end up with, with um, u sigma times x hat. And 
uh, uh, pl plus noise. And then at the receiver, you, you multiply, you pre-multiply by uh, the U inverse, right, or U conjugate transpose, um, and that is the post-coding. So we have pre-coding and post-coding, or decoding, and, and that gives you your Y hat, which is your estimate of X hat. And so um, if we expand that out, now the, the U inverse con cancels the U, and we end up with sigma X and plus U, U inverse times the noise. Now, U inverse, we said, is unitary, so then there's no noise gain, right? We've rotated the noise, but noise is random anyway, so it's effectively the same thing, right? So we end up with the same noise, but our signal, our S, our, our, our X, our values in the, in the, in the um, vector X have been multiplied by sigma. Now, sigma is a diagonal matrix, so it means there's an individual gain applied to each element. Now, so, um, so what does that mean? That means that the, the individual channels are now preserved. X, uh, X hat has been transferred over, with, and the only change has been a gain to each, each one has its own individual gain. And so, so let's look at that. I actually have a, using octave actually here, and um, let's, we'll just show a little plot of, of what happened. So this is, uh, this is um, set up to do, I'm not sure why it's not zooming. Um, this is set up for uh, four, four transmit antennas, four receive antennas, but only using two spatial uh, streams, right? You can see that's why I have 442 in there. Four transmit, four receive, two spatial streams. And you can see the, the, in the dominant eigen mode, the, 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 the first, the first um, spatial stream, uh, it's, all, it's red, and you can see it's a big um, QAM 16. In the second one, it's weaker, right? It's, the SVD implementations all sort these so that you get the, the strongest one first, the next one, right? And then, I, and then we put nothing into the next two I, uh, uh, modes, and so those just, you know, the, the blue and the, and the pink show up as uh, single points because we put no energy into those. But we put energy into the red and into the green, and the green came through not as strong because it was, it was the weaker mode. Um, does that make sense? Okay, so now let's say we, we had um, the same system, but um, the same two uh, eigenmodes that we wanted to, uh, sorry, same two spatial streams, but now we only had three antennas on transmit and three antennas on receive. And so that's going to pop up hopefully. Um, and you can see similar, right? But now um, what, what happens if we only had two of each? And what, what tends to happen is that your, um, your second, right, if you have N, N, transmit, the N transmit and N receive, your last one, your, your, your fourth, you know, your last spatial stream is going to be weaker than the others. And in this case, you can see it's pretty noisy, right? It hasn't come through as strongly. And, and that's pretty common. So, so now I've got this N in a um, GNU radio flow graph with the SVD, and so we can get a little more dynamic view of, of this. So again, what we have here is um, we have our, our channel taps, an SVD precoder. Uh, we apply the MIMO taps and a postcoder. Now the precoder and the postcoder both receive the taps on their inputs. Um, in a practical implementation, you know, you, you're going to have to feed that back from the receiver, but for demonstration purposes, we just feed it in, in both of them. And so um, here again, we have our, our uh, QAM16 and our QPSK, and you can see we have our input signal on the upper left, then we have the, the output of the precoder on the right, and then we have what's received by the receiver in the lower left and uh, post decoding on the, on the lower right. So if we again had this magical fiber optic like channel, you can see the precoder and the receive channel, it looks exactly the same and, and our output is decoded correctly. But now what happens if, let's say the first channel goes into the second channel? Well, again, you have to ha add these, these um, you, 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 you have a superposition in the channel, but here we've ad adapted, right? So we have pre-coded, based, uh, based on the superposition coming from the channel matrix, we have put some of that into the pre-coding, or the opposite of part of it into the pre-coding, so that when it's received at the, on the other end of the channel, the decoding can remove the rest of it and get us back to the two separate signals in the, in the output. And, but you can see now, as I created, car, what I'm doing here, remember this is, we're going from a, a matrix that's uh, basically an identity matrix right now, 
in, in this setting, or this is close, there's the identity matrix. Uh, we're going from an identity matrix to now in a matrix that's 1, 1, 0, 1. And so it has some, it is, it's, it's invertible, and it's not ill-conditioned, but it does have correlation. And what happens is the correlation actually adds to the energy of the first um, mode, and so the, the blue actually gets bigger, right? But the, it, it, re, it reduces the energy in the second mode, which is the red, and you can see that that gets smaller as I do that. Now, as, now if, I, if I then make it perfectly correlated, now this is an ill-conditioned matrix, and we get nothing of the second signal through, and right, you see that's why this red is in the center, there's no, there's no circular um, uh, constellation, but all that energy is used productively by the, by the dominant mode, and, and, and that grows even bigger. So in this case, we, because we have a perfect correlation, we still get the first dominant mode through, we just don't get the second one through. So I'm gonna um, switch this over to a dynamic channel and see, you know, we can, we can just watch what that looks like, um, you know, in, in practice where this is a dynamic and complex channel. I was just doing the real coefficients there. So we'll turn on the Doppler and you can see all sorts of cool patterns, right? You can see these circles on top of the squares. And, but, and you can watch as on the receive side, on the post decoding side in the lower right, you'll see that the, the, um, the circle will change size relative to the, to the square. And that's again, because of a, sh a shift in the relative energy in the two um, modes. Now, again, as I increase the correlation, right here, I just have a, a slider for correlation. You can see a perfectly correlated channel, our second mode goes away, right? Now, the cool thing about the, um, about the SVD is it, it, will, it will choose the right um, uh, way to get your dominant channel through. So even if, if your channel was just the first antenna getting through to the first antenna on the receive side and nothing on the second, it would send the QAM16. But if you switch it to the second one on both sides, it would still send the QAM16 because we've put that as the input to, to, to the, the dominant channel uh, input on the, on the precoder. Right. If we swap those, the it, it would um, it it would prefer the the um, the circular uh, the the QPSK uh, the the PSK com, uh, constellation. So now, what does this look like in practice? So let's. So here I have um, this. This we're just going to look at the amplitudes of the um, of the of the si signal. So I just send a, basically a one into all channels here. But again, we have the same. Um, MIMO taps, we have this SVD precoder and stuff, and we view the individual taps as well as the output signal. Did you, can I have a couple, couple minutes? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So, so here, let me turn down the correlation, and this, this shows us the, the signal uh, versus, versus time. And so on the top plot, you can see the, um, the blue, red, green, and cyan, which may or may not be visible, are the individual channel taps. And you can see that they have big dips and stuff, but that the dominant mode of the SVD is black, and you can see it's always above all of them. And then the second mode is the purple, and you can see sometimes that actually does pretty well, but sometimes it drops low when, when there tends to be correlation. Now, if I, if I increase the correlation, you'll see that purple drops significantly and, and if I increase it enough, the purple will drop off the screen, uh, you know, off the display. But, and the others match. But if we, if we turn the correlation back off and you look at the bottom, here we have our histogram, and you can see that the purple is somewhat lower than the average of the, of the others, but the, the gray, which is, the, uh, is the, um, the dominant mode, is always stronger. So what this is showing is that, that with this SVD precoding, you're always getting this, this, this gain in the system, at least for that dominant mode. Um, and, and you're able to, um, to, uh, to, to communicate e e even in, in the presence of the correlated multipath um, and, and, and pretty deep fades. So just going back to the slide, so, so again, that's what we showed here, and we actually have the code, the code to do this is surprisingly simple. I did this in, a, in Python blocks, and really this, this line here, this is, this is all you really need to do. I mean, you, you, you have your matrix, you, 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 you do your singular, your H matrix, you do your SVD of it, and then you do a multiplication 
and and that's all. That that's the that's the postcoder, and then the precoder does the same thing, except it 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 multiplies by vh instead of instead of uh. So so the code is you know the code is incredibly simple. Obviously, getting the the channel state information back to the transmitter is 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 more the 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 problem there. Um, but anyway, um, that's uh, that's uh, as, uh, you know. Let's call it intermediate MIMO and uh, and uh, SVD precoding. Um, so thank you. And um, does anybody have any questions? Thanks, Matt. Oh, and while while I do that, I I have um, I am uh, 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 I can. This is how you can contact me if you have any questions. And I am, like apparently everyone else here for every year, forever, I am recruiting. Um, I work at Apple, and I can finally say this as of a few weeks ago. I am, I am part of the satellite connectivity group. So if you are interested in working on that sort of thing uh, at Apple, uh, let me know. We, um, our group actually uses GNU Radio and, and, and does a lot of uh, cool communication stuff. So uh, let me know if you uh, are looking for, uh, for a job. Uh, thanks, Matt. Um, that's a that's really interesting. I'm, I'm I'm I come from a radio astronomy background, but I love seeing the the sort of the interchange of um, linear algebra and communication. That that really fascinates me. Um, again, coming from a radio astronomy background, we um, we do have the interstellar medium uh, being a, a a sort of a, a um, medium that that applies a transfer function on on whatever signals comes comes through. The problem is we cannot always estimate. Um, the transfer function in your precoder. How um, I'm interested to know how do you actually um, know the uh, you know 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 that transfer function to apply it on your transmitters, and um, does that only affect receivers in one particular direction, and um, can you do it for multiple receivers? I guess. Yeah. So, good, good question. So, um, how you actually get that channel state information back to the to the transmitter, or it, it was it's two aspects: is getting it back to the transmitter, but also how does the receiver figure it out? So, so this is a, this is a more complex flow graph that I didn't didn't show. But what we do here is we have the precoder, SVD precoder, but also we add in some known symbols, and th this is this is essentially what all um, comm systems will do these days: is they add in pilot symbols um, and. Sometimes those pilot symbols are modulated or whatever, but they're known at, to, the, to both the transmitter and the receiver. So in, in, this, in this particular flow graph, what we have is for every eight symbols of, um, uh, eight, 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 uh, symbols of, of, of useful data, we also send two um, pilots. And one pilot is, in this case, the way I did it, it was one transmitter sends a pilot while the other sends nothing, and then we switch. And then the other transmitter sends nothing, and the, and the second one sends the pilot. And that way, in two time periods, you, the, both receive antennas can compute what their, transmit, what their transfer function was to the first transmitter, and then what their transfer function was to the second transmitter. Um, and so it, that's very similar to what's done in like LTE and 5G. They have these, these, these tones and, 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 and Wi-Fi where you, you, you have these known symbols. Um, Usually it's not that simple, and they'll put like an array of them all, all through the OFDM matrix or something. But essentially, it always comes back to I sent a one, and I got a 0 0.707 plus 0 0.707i. That means there was a 45 degree rotation, and, and that, that's essentially what it is. So, so now that that's not a perfect measure, right? It'll it'll have its own noise, and so that's typically um, you either want to add more energy to it, or you want to um, uh, send it a couple times, or average over several of them so that you can. Um, get a, a good estimate because it, none, none of this, you know, if, if the estimate's noisy, it's going to that noise is going to add into your system. So, so usually it's the pilot tone. Sometimes um, it, you you may you may just use decision directed equalizing and and sort of you guess at what a signal was and and um, and sort of co compensate. But but in in more in most MIMO systems, you just send independent um, uh, uh, pilots. Anybody else? All right, so let's close that. Or, or do you have a? Okay, one more question. Foreseeable, um, can you put these online, those flow graphs? And yeah, 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 I'll, I'll get the, the flow graphs. Um, I have the, the, the blocks are all on, on GitHub, but I need to get the flow graphs up as well.
But I should but, say they're, these are for pedagogical purposes only. They're not set up to be efficient or, or, or that practical in, in, a, in a real situation, but it shows you the algorithms. All right. Thank you, Matt. Th so. Thank you.